It's a real joy to welcome you to our online service. I'm Wes, one of the leaders here. Now, boys and girls, if you're listening, it's only 12, 12 sleeps until you wake up and it's what? Christmas Day, woohoo! And this year, it seems like everyone has gone early in getting up the decorations. Hey, why not to lift spirits with the difficulties that they've been. But as God's people, we've got every reason to have our spirits lifted daily as we think about how great our Saviour Jesus is. Today in this service, we're focusing on setting our hearts and gaze right for Christmas. We're thinking about not just the what of Christmas, but the why, which is all about the tender mercy of God that Rich will preach on later. Because if we're not careful, if we don't get our hearts and our gaze right, we we can get caught up, can't we, in so many lovely Christmassy things, but we can miss that the real wonder of what it is all about, which of course is good news of great joy for all the people. We're going to begin by singing a carol, then Mel will open in prayer for us and then it's over for our kids talk thank you
Let's pray together. Father God, you the Most High, the God of Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Redeemer, the one through whom everything is being created. You created the earth and heaven and the seas and everything. You created everything, absolutely everything, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Him, the way, the truth, and the life. The one who will come back and lead us home. The one through Him we are shown blameless and through whom we are redeemed. We thank you, God, for today. We thank you that we have again opportunity to praise you, to come with joy, to come and rejoice in your name, to come and gather together, even through this uh, technology. We thank you because we are able today to be in your presence. And we know that you are among every single person of us. You live in us, you talk to us, you are with us. Lord, please today open the heart of everyone. Open the ears of our heart. Open the eyes of our soul and make us able to worship you today in spirit and truth. Let's all come together with joy and celebrate and praise the only one worthy of, of our praises. Let us exalt him let us glorify him let us sing to him christ our lord the way the truth and the life we pray all these things in the name of jesus christ amen hi there my name is helen and i work with the kids at the slade church it's great to see you isn't it great when you're included in something and not left out We've been having some Christmas cards come into our house and this one's from my cousin and look, she included everybody's name in it. No one was left out. I'm sure it'll be the same in your house on Christmas Day that everybody gets a present from under the Christmas tree. Well, the wonderful thing about God's plan for each of us is that he wants us all to be saved. And here in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, it tells us, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now I've been looking through Matthew and Luke right at the very beginning about the Christmas story and I've noticed some things about who is included in God's plan for salvation. Some of the first people are the shepherds. Do you remember them? They're really important in the story at the beginning there. But did you know that the shepherds were actually not very well thought of? If you'd been walking down the street back then and seen some shepherds you'd have crossed to the other side but God included them and who else have I picked out let's have a look oh the wise men wow why do you think they were included well they weren't Jewish were they they weren't Israelites they were really rich surely that would mean that they couldn't be part of God's story but God included them because he wanted everybody to be saved I've got two more groups of people left We've got Mary and Joseph. And today we're skipping forward. We've had Jesus being born and we're skipping forward a few days to a special time when people would take the firstborn son and they'd go and dedicate him to God at the temple. And when they got to the temple, they'd bring a sacrifice. And Mary and Joseph, did you know that they were really poor? They didn't have loads of money. And the Bible tells us that they gave two doves. They didn't give a big sacrifice, but two do doves. And that didn't stop them from being part of God's plan. God included them. He included the shepherds who nobody really liked. He included the wise men who weren't Jewish. Was that important? No. He included Mary and Joseph who didn't have loads of money. And the next lot is Simeon and Anna. Now let's take a look at their part in the Bible story today. In Jerusalem lived a man named Simeon who was a godly man. He was waiting for the time when God would take away Israel's sorrow and the Holy Spirit was in him. 
Simeon had been told by the Holy Spirit he would not die before he saw the Christ promised by the Lord. The Spirit led Simeon to the temple. When Mary and Joseph brought the baby Jesus to the temple to do what the Lord said they must do, Simeon took the baby in his arms and thanked God. Now, Lord, you can let me, your servant, die in peace, as you said. With my own eyes, I've seen your salvation, which you prepared before all people. It is a light for the non-Jewish people to see and an honour for your people, the Israelites. Now in the temple, there was a prophet named Anna, and she'd been praying and living in the temple for years. And she was there when baby Jesus came and she thanked God and told many people about him. Well, wow, that sure was lots of fun to do. You can read that story for yourself in Luke chapter 2 and verse 22. Well, Simeon and Anna, they were waiting, they were Jewish, waiting for God's promised saviour. And in verse 31, it points out also that God's salvation was for all people. Well, that was just so amazing. Kids, think about that this week. Maybe you can draw yourself some pictures. Who are your favourite characters? The, the shepherds, the wise men, Mary and Joseph. Will you read that? And remember that you are included too. Because in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, it says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Kids, the best present that you could have for yourself or give to other people this Christmas, surely it's knowing that Jesus has died for us. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that anyone who calls on your name will be saved. Help us to remember that this week and call out to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So. Up you get on your feet then if you can and let's sing to that amazing, amazing God who came to save each one of us. It's the King song. We're going back in time now to the time of King David. Let's go! A long, 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 long time ago God made a promise He would send a king a great, 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 great grandson promised to David He would be a great king who would rule forevermore King forever King forever we want King forever Jesus the King God Travelling through time to the time of Isaiah. Here we go. A long, 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 long time ago, God sent a prophet to describe his king. Wonderful, powerful, peaceful, eternal, he will have a kingdom. It will have no end. He is the king of everyone. Doesn't stop. Tick tock, tick tock. It's time for the New Testament. A little less long, but still quite long ago, God spoke to Mary. You will have a son. The great, 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 great grandson promised to David. You will call him Jesus, and his kingdom will not end. What? Never, ever, ever. King of
I'm 100% confident The king of your street, he's the king of your home But is he your king, cause he's seated on his throne He's the king of your street, and the king of your home And he's coming back in glory, so that everyone will know Now every Christmas here at the Slade, we have a special offering and that goes towards some fantastic needy project. And this year we're raising money for Tear Fund. They're a Christian charity who help relieve poverty while sharing the love of Jesus in some of the poorest parts of the world. We're going to watch a video in a moment and I hope as a church we're really going to come together and be as generous as possible to give over and above what our normal giving to the church is. Please, if you want to give, and I hope most of you do, who belong to our church family, just go to the church website, uh, click on the section giving, and that goes immediately to the Christmas offering fund and details there. Let, let's make this the biggest Christmas offering hey, we've ever had. Okay. Let's watch the video. Hello, my name is Stephen German. Thank you for inviting me to share for a few minutes and for taking an interest in the work that TFUN does around the world to bring good news, respond to disaster and alleviate poverty. I'm Miriam Blythe's brother, in case you didn't know. I have the privilege to work with TFUN based in the UK. Um, but in the past, uh, I worked in DRC, which was Zaire at the time, for six years, for five years in the south of Tunisia and four years in Cairo, Egypt. But I wanted to bring two particular asks to you today that God has put on my heart and that I hope will stir your compassion as well. For the first, let me take you on a journey to the heart or the Pearl of Africa, as Uganda is often called. Driving up to the northwest of the country, you will find a number of refugee settlements for South Sudanese refugees who are fleeing fighting in their country. And before traveling was stopped with COVID, I went to one of these settlements where we work with the Bible Society, with Mother's Union, YWAM and a few other Christian NGOs. We met to see how we could support the refugee church and help people in the settlements through the church, which is Tear Fund's preferred way of working. We got to visit one of the settlements, Bidi Bidi, which has about a quarter of a million people, to hear some of the stories of people living there. Pastors were overwhelmed with demands on them. The children had horror stories of what they'd seen and experienced but the women typically had the hardest stories of all and continue to face the biggest difficulties living in the settlements. I met with a group of these women and when asked about their greatest needs, they talked about the loss of dignity and the impact on their lives of not having any hygiene equipment. There are about 64,000 girls and women above 12 suffering just in this settlement. And though many of their needs are being met, they can obtain basic building material to make houses and huts, get a blanket and often a sponge mattress to sleep on, and get hold of clean water from boreholes, basic food supplies to provide the minimum requirement and even some schooling, but nothing for them as women for their personal hygiene. No hygiene kits, or as they call them, no dignity kits. And as a result, there is shame. There is reduced opportunity for women to get out and interact with others. Many girls are missing up to a quarter of their schooling. And women end up cutting up blankets and clothes or selling off precious food to obtain them. So Tear Fund, with our partner, are providing these dignity kits with reusable materials that can last from six months to a year. A training is provided alongside the distribution. And as the kits are being made by women inside the settlement, they can get a little income as well. The training and a kit for one woman that will last over six months costs about three pounds. It isn't an enormous expense, but it is a life changer. The other project, which is quite different from the first, is to provide good Christian literature 
for pastors and church leaders when I or members of my team travel. Normally in English or French, we find people hungry for good Christian books. So recently I took out How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. But sometimes people ask me in advance for items that they can't get hold of locally. So thank you for listening and God bless you and your church as you consider these two projects. And I wish you a wonderful Advent and Christmas, even if it's not going to be exactly how you would have chosen it. God bless. After the service today, it's virtual coffee. And then tonight, it's prayer and praise at 8 p.m. Now, an advance notice for Christmas Day and Sunday the 27th. Our services will be on Zoom, okay? That's to give our amazing tech team um, a mini Christmas break. Details will be sent out, of course. Now, next Saturday at 11 a.m. outside the community caf opposite the Slade shops, we're having a carol singing event and we would love as many as possible of you to come and to join in. Of course, we're all going to be socially distanced, but the more that come, the merrier and the louder that we'll be. We're going to be giving out um, invites to our carol services there at church, along with some Christian uh, leaflets as well to give out to your friends. Come along to church and, and pick them up. There's different time slots that were in the email we sent out on Friday. And this is going to be incredibly a first opportunity for many of you to see one another in nine months. It's staggering, isn't it? Now, now there's so much we can't do this Christmas, but this is the one key thing we can do. So, so please come, bring, bring all the family. Uh, Martin and Vida, they're kindly uh, running this informal event, but they really need to know how many are coming. So please email them. That was also on the uh, church email, their address. And uh, put your names down, uh, email them as soon as possible. Now, next Sunday, it's our nativity service at 10.30 in the morning. That'll be going up on YouTube as normal. And then at 6 p.m., um, it's our carols by candlelight service. That will be live streamed. Now, at both these services, we would love you to, to do whatever you can to get your friends, your neighbours, your family uh, to come and watch online. Uh, it's all online for the morning service. For the evening, as I've said, it's live streamed, so you can watch it online, but you can also come in person and uh, you can invite people to come in person. Now, obviously, they have got to sign up uh, as well as you, and you, you will need to warn them just about the details of coming with masks. Um, we'll be socially distanced as we're seated. We won't be able to sing carols. The choir can, though, which will be great. Um, there'll be none of the usual refreshments, mince pies. But, wow, maybe people want to come along and see our wizzo, sparkly, newly refurbished building. So please um, do everything you can next Sunday to invite people along to those services. Phew, notice is done, okay? Today's Bible reading is taken by Kay and Caroline Gamson from Luke chapter one. Um, Rich is going to be preaching, as mentioned, on the why of Christmas, the tender mercy of God. And it's going to be seen through this wonderful story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. They were a godly couple and they longed to have children, but Elizabeth remained childless even into her older years. Zechariah was a priest and he had the real privilege on one occasion of being chosen to go into the temple and to burn incense on behalf of the people. But while he was there, a remarkable thing happened. Gabriel, an angel of the Lord, appeared to him and told him that his wife Elizabeth would bear a son and she was to call him they were to call him John uh, he would grow up to be John the Baptist the cousin and the forerunner of Jesus um, Rich will share a few more incidents but the Bible reading is Zechariah's response and prophecy after John was born after the reading uh, Tanya will lead us in prayer before we sing again and then Rich will preach to us. 
I'm reading from Luke 1, verses 67 to 75. His father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestor and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. To you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you for Christmas, the celebration of Jesus' birthday. Through Jesus, you show us how much you love us. You gave your only Son, so we can call you Father. Thank you for the hope and peace that we have in Jesus, so we know that we are not alone. You are with us, and you take care of us every day. May you help us to share this amazing love with our friends and family. May you help our church with all the plans for the Christmas services. Give us wisdom and guidance, so your name will be glorified. Our prayer this Christmas is that everyone will know you and give their lives to you. Lord, thank you for rich preaching on Luke 1 this morning, and may you be with him and may your spirit empower him. Lord, I pray that you speak to us today. Help us to understand your word and to keep it in, your, in our hearts. May you bless and help us to live a life that pleases you. Lord God, thank you for our government, and I pray that you be with them, bless and guide them during the Brexit negotiations. Thank you, Lord, for this new vaccine, and may all people be vaccinated in time, may they respond well and without serious side effects. Thank you for all our key workers, and may, we, may you bless and protect, protect them. I pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.
I had a very humbling Christian father moment earlier this week with our two and a half year old we've been trying to teach him about Christmas we've got the nativity scene out we've shown him the little baby Jesus and as we've been walking around to look at the Christmas lights explaining to him the the real reason for Christmas Uh, and feeling like uh, we've done a pretty good job when on FaceTime with my mum earlier in the week I thought we would kind of show him off a little bit so I said oh Michael what are we celebrating at Christmas his answer cake like father, like son. Well, well, no, we wanted to share with him, no Christmas is celebrating Jesus' birth. And as Christians, we are very keen to make that point, that Christmas ultimately isn't about the food and the decorations, uh, the time with family, as lovely as that is, and how precious that will be for those who can do that this Christmas with all that's going on, and how sad and hard it's going to be for those who can't. No, no, we're keen to point out Christmas. You can't take Christ out of Christmas. Jesus is the reason for the season uh, and so on. And of course that is right. But this morning, I want to focus not just on the what of Christmas, Jesus, God himself, Emmanuel, come to be with us, but particularly focus on the why of Christmas. You see, the Bible doesn't allow us to to make up our own reason or to decide for ourselves what Christmas is all about. The Bible tells us very clearly. And this morning, as we look at Zechariah's poem, we're going to see the why of Christmas. And as we see that, I'm hoping that it's going to ensure that for, for you, if you're a Christian, that this Christmas you're not celebrating cake or family and friends or food or whatever else it might be we are truly celebrating Christ and in fact maybe that if someone asks you this reason oh why do you make such a big deal of Christmas well then hopefully this will help you have a good answer for them and if you're not a Christian as we look at Zechariah's poem this morning you're going to see why Jesus is so worthy of celebrating So Zechariah, he was the father of John the Baptist and not believing God's word when the angel appeared to him, where when the angel said that his barren and elderly wife was going to have a child, not believing that he was struck dumb. And so for nine months, nine months, he didn't say he couldn't say a word, nine months without speaking until the baby was born. And Zechariah did what the angel had told him. Zechariah named the child John. And as he did that, his tongue was loosed. And he, in fact, burst out praising God after all that time. And in uh, chapter 1, verse 66, we see that everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. The question is, what is this child? What is John going to be? Zechariah answers. But in fact, it's not just Zechariah, it's God. God answers that question. Because you see in verse 67 that that Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and he prophesied, he spoke for God. Now you might think it's a little strange that we'd be looking and focusing on Zechariah and John the Baptist. Surely we should be looking at Mary and Joseph and Jesus. But actually in these first two chapters of Luke's Gospel, John and Jesus are intertwined. At every step we see them most echoing each other. Now John the Baptist is integral to Jesus' coming. But equally, let's, no, not, let's make no mistake that Jesus is infinitely superior to John. And in fact, here as Zechariah rejoices at being a father, he does speak to his son, yet he speaks more of Jesus. But let's begin with our question, why? The why of Christmas? Why Christmas? And well, the answer comes to us in this wonderful phrase at the beginning of verse 78. It says, because of the tender mercy of our God because of the tender mercy of our God. It's a great phrase, uh, even in English, isn't it? It evokes 
um, great images and, uh, and great thoughts, perhaps of a, a big brute of a man tenderly holding his little baby. But it, in fact, it packs even more of a punch in the original language. This, this phrase, a tender mercy. Uh, mercy is, is God's loyal, faithful, gracious love that he shows to people. It's treating them not as they deserve. But then this word tender uh, also can be translated as compassionate. So this is compassionate mercy. He's intensifying uh, this phrase. The word can also be used uh, for bowels or heart. And so in this phrase of the tender mercy, we see the heart-wrenching, gentle, compassionate mercy of God. Why Christmas? Why did Jesus come? Because of the tender mercy of our God. How do you think of God? We say, God, well, what image comes to your mind? Do you see a, a Zeus-like figure sitting on the cloud with his, uh, his lightning bolt, looking down, looking for a reason to, to launch it down? Do you see God as the, the stern headmaster who takes a bit of delight in telling off pupils? Do you see God as the, the driving test examiner the, it, there, wherever you go, looking over your shoulder, scribbling on his notebook, marking everything wrong that you've done? Do you see that God as the, the super strict, stingy father, where it feels like every bit of praise, every kindness, every blessing that he gives is, is done kind of begrudgingly? Now, if you've been for a Christian for a while, uh, for a while then you'd never say, say it anything as crassly like that. But I do wonder sometimes if we have wrong images of God the Father, we see him as less inclined to smile than his son, less inclined to do us good. His blessings come just a little bit hesitantly. But we've got to see that, and we see that so clearly here through these verses. Jesus didn't come so that God would, would like us and do good to us. Jesus came because, because, the God, because God the Father is so wonderfully and richly and compassionately and tenderly merciful at the very core of his being. Zechariah recognises that. He recognises that all that is going to happen with the coming of the Saviour it's because of the tender mercy of our God. And so he opens his poem in verse 68. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel. He praises God the Father for all that he's going to do. The next line, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He sees that this is God intervening, God stepping down. And in fact, this has been God's promise, uh, God's plan from long ago. He's promised it, uh, firstly to uh, David, and then before that even to Abraham, and indeed to all of uh, the Israelites. We see that time and again in verses 69 to 73. Why Christmas? Because of the tender love, sorry, the tender mercy of our God. I've only made mulled wine once. Uh, but what you do is you, you put the wine in and, and then you put the fruit and the spices and, and you stir it around and you, and you leave it simmering for quite a long time because you want uh, the wine to infuse with the flavour of those spices. Well, let these six words infuse your Christmas this year. The tender mercy of our God. Now, if that's going to be true for you this Christmas, then uh, you've got to have it simmering, got to have it stirring in our hearts and our lives. Just write down that phrase, the tender mercy of our God. Put it on your Christmas tree. Write it in your Christmas cards to one another. Make the tender mercy of our God the theme of your Christmas this year. Now, with the, the, that foundational why firmly in our minds, let's see what the tender mercy of our God led to. And we see the big point that we see running through these verses is the tender mercy of our God sent Jesus to save. 
sent Jesus to save. See how verse 69 begins. He, that's God the Father, he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. Did you notice there how he put that in the past tense? Just like he, in fact, he had done in the previous verse. Now these events were still to happen, but they are so certain they're absolutely sure and so that they can be written about as if they'd already happened. Out of his tender mercy, he has raised up a horn of salvation. Salvation, that, that's the big theme. You'll have spot the word come a number of times through these verses. And he puts it in different ways to draw the picture of what salvation means. In verse 69, as 66, 68, sorry, he talks about um, the Lord redeeming, or he redeemed the people. Now, when God's people would have heard this originally, their minds would have immediately gone back to the Exodus, because to redeem means to set free upon the payment of a price. And they would have thought back to the Exodus when God set his people free from the land of Egypt. He set them free from slavery. And here, Zechariah points us to this new exodus, this upcoming redemption. Verse 71 and verse 74 uh, talk about saving and rescuing from enemies, from their hand, from their oppressive restriction. The tender mercy of our God sent Jesus to save, for to bring salvation. But it's an interesting, again, little phrase and one that I've not really thought about or noticed much before. He has raised up a horn of salvation. Uh, a horn, not here talking about the musical instruments, but by talking about the animal's horns. The, the ox probably particularly prominently in mind. Uh, in, in biblical times, the, the horn was a symbol of power and strength. Now, when we think of a, an ox's horn, we're probably, in our modern ears, we're probably not too impressed by that. But when you hear the horn of salvation, think the tractor of salvation. Okay, maybe don't get too carried away with that. But, but the, the ox was the, the animal that farmed basically the whole world. It was powerful, it was strong. And its horn, that was the business end of things. It was the pointy, literally, end of things. And so we see here that actually this is a wonderful description of Jesus. He is the, the power of salvation. He is the pointy end of salvation. He is the one who, who brings about that salvation ultimately and so fully. Now at this time, God's people were no longer obviously in slavery in Egypt, but they were occupied and oppressed by the Roman Empire. And it may be that Zechariah had in mind here that uh, this, this saviour was going to come and, and rescue them from the Romans. But he, like most at the time, and in fact some even today, didn't realise that that political and national victory wasn't going to come at Jesus' first coming, but it will come at his second coming. But whether Zechariah had that in mind uh, or not, he certainly knew that it was more than just a, a national political rescue. Because he knew that the reason the nation were in such a mess was because of a spiritual problem. It was because of their sin. Repeated, repeated, repeated sin. Rebellion against God, turning their backs on him, going their own way, had led to the situation that they were in. And particularly we see it so clearly in verse 76 when Zechariah turns and, as it were, predicts, prophesies, speaks to his son, John the Baptist, who's only just been born. But he says this in verse 76, And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. You see, Zechariah prophesied about John. Uh, he said, look, John, you're going to be a prophet. That is, you're going to be a representative of God. You are going to speak for God. 
Now that is a really, um, a really big thing for the God's people at that time. For 400 years, they'd had no prophet in Israel. 400 years of God not speaking to them. But now, with John, comes a prophet, comes God's voice, comes God's word. He's a prophet, uh, but secondly, he's also the preparer. Did you see that? In the end of verse 76, he's going to prepare the way of the Lord. He's going to get them ready for the Lord. Now, how is he going to do that? Well, remember, as I've just said, by and large, the people in that day were looking for a rescuer to save them from the Romans. And so, verse, uh, verse 77, how does he prepare the way? Well, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. He points out that John the Baptist's role was to get the people ready for Jesus. He was going to uh, show them salvation, but the salvation, the ultimate salvation, which comes through the forgiveness of sins. That's the wonderful role that John the Baptist would play. Because of the tender mercy of our God, he sent Jesus to bring salvation through the forgiveness of sins. John the Baptist was just getting people ready for that, calling them to repentance, to turn from their sin. Jesus was the one who brought that salvation. The people then, us now, every single human being who's ever lived, lived is in need of saving. And as a fireman rescues from fire, a lifeguard, lifeguard rescues from drowning, so Jesus saves from sin. From sins, sins, uh, those wrong things that we do, those right things that we fail to do. All the selfishness, pride, greed, and so many other things that come from a heart that is living in rejection to God. And all those things... They deserve justice. They deserve to rightly be punished. But praise God for his tender mercy. His tender mercy, which has its greatest expression in bringing forgiveness from sin. Jesus is the horn of salvation, the pointy end of salvation, the power of salvation, bringing forgiveness of sins, all because of the tender mercy of our God. Have you realised that you need saving? Have you realised you need saving from, from sin? I think as human beings, we're usually wrong about uh, thinking about what we really need. I think we tend to look outward, first of all, outward at circumstances. Whereas actually we see here that the problem is inside of us. Now, if this is intriguing you, but you don't really understand it, something you've not thought about, please do continue to join us through this Christmas time to see how Jesus is this wonderful saviour from sins. Please do come back again to our carol services in the coming weeks. Please do get in touch if you'd like to talk to me or, or one of the team about uh, this further. But this passage, uh, this song of Zechariah, gives us, I think, two implications. Two implications of the tender mercy of God shown in the coming of Jesus. Jesus, the, the horn of salvation, the pointy end of salvation. The one who brought salvation, not simply by being born at Christmas, but by dying at Easter. The first implication is praise the God of tender mercy. Salvation isn't something that we can achieve by working our way towards God. It is something that he brings, has brought by coming to us in Jesus. And therefore he deserves the praise. That's how Zechariah starts this poem. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel. Praise him. What a wonderful salvation we have. Praise him. And so this Christmas time, but before you reach for the now 100 Christmas songs, or whatever it might be. Go for the carols. Praise him 
for this great salvation that we have, for his tender mercy. The second implication I think we have through here is serve the God of tender mercy. You see, God wants to do more than just to get us to heaven. We see here and we see through the Bible that we are saved to serve. We are redeemed for a reason. Did you spot that in verse 74? Having talked about the mercy that he's going to show, the, the horn of salvation coming, in verse 74, again, we get the reason why. To rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. We're saved from, from our sins. So stop living for those sins. Instead of living for them, for ourselves, live for God and to serve him. That is the purpose of our salvation, to turn away from them, to turn away from our old life, to, to live for God in everything, without fear, in holiness, in righteousness. Now, how do we do that? There are all kinds of manner of ways. You will know the particular sins and struggles that you're going through at the moment. Remember, Jesus came to save you from those sins. Turn from those sins and live for him, serve him. One very obvious way that we can do that at this time is to be sharing this wonderful message of the Saviour with others. This is a great time and a great opportunity this Christmas to do so, to hand out invitations to our services, to give out those little tracts um, that we've got in. If you'd like to, you can come in and pick some up from church this week. So you can give those out. But ultimately, you, you don't need a bit of paper. You can do this yourself to share this Christmas, the reason, not just what happened, but the reason why it happened too. The tender mercy of our God. That's the reason for Christmas. And I want to finish by using it and building upon the illustration that Zechariah uses in verses 78 and 79. Let me read them. Because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. Here Zechariah pictures uh, a group a group who are travelling and they're being pursued by their enemies. And on their, on their flight, darkness overtakes them uh, and they lose their place on the path. And eventually they've, they've got to stop. They've got to hunker down for the night. And it's a night of terror. All the animal noises in the wild that could be coming to get them. And every noise thinking this could be the enemies finally catching up with them. In the darkness of death there's no sleep but they are looking to the horizon they are waiting and then the sun starts to rise and the light creeps in and it is for them the light of salvation it is the light of rescue this light guides their feet to the paths of peace and to their safety and how apt an illustration this is for God's people, for you and I, if you are trusting in Jesus. How that was true of us, how we were living in, dark, in the darkness and destruction of sin. Living in the, the shadow of death. But with Jesus' coming, light, salvation. I don't like this time of year very much in terms of how dark it is so much of the time. But one of the nice things is, is getting to see sunrises, which I wouldn't usually get. And seeing the wonderful colours as the sun creeps up. But the sun rises for us, or at least as it appears, we see the sun rising from the ground. That's what it looks like to us. But did you see the difference in verse 78? Here we see the rising sun comes down from heaven. That the rising sun that gives light, that brings salvation, that guides us to the path of peace, is Jesus the sun 
coming, the horn of salvation, to bring peace, peace with God, safety and life with him. This Christmas, remember and celebrate Jesus' coming. Remember and celebrate the why of Jesus' coming. His, the reason why, the tender mercy of our God. Praise him, serve him. We're going to finish by singing a, a carol. You won't be surprised to know that carol we're going to sing is Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Now we're not just singing this because it's my favourite. We're singing it because it fits so well. Let me read the last uh, verse for us. Hail the heaven born, Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness. Now note the Son in the original was S-U-N, the Son of Righteousness. But of course that S-U-N is the S-O-N. Light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Let's sing. Let's close our service in prayer. Almighty God, may we all join with the angels in praising you for sending Jesus, uh, the then newborn, but now today, the ruling and the reigning King. What a God you are, full of mercy, in gracious kindness, how you looked down on the world 2000 years ago, and instead of judging us because of our rebellion and sin, in your mercy, you wonderfully sent your Son, our Saviour. May you now and always have not only our praise for our fabulous salvation, but may you have our whole lives as we gladly serve you. In Jesus' precious and glorious name we pray. Amen. 
Well, goodbye and God bless you and really hope you can join us next week for both our Christmas services, 10.30 and 6 p.m. Thank you. of peace.